So we'll get going. This webinar is titled How to Create a Pitch Deck. And this it is meant to give you some framework thoughts and plans and strategies as to how you might want to create a pitch deck. It could be for your startup, but I think a lot of the principles we're talking about here uh, could apply to research or social innovations. Uh, anytime you're trying to really uh, convey a project to an audience. Just one second here. So we'll start off by talking about the important elements of a pitch deck. And at the end of the day, this boils down to what's your story? And there's a nice quote here from a gentleman that runs uh, or partner at Real Ventures in Montreal. It says, in the absence of data, investors have little choice but to lean heavily on the story of what's to come. So that's probably the fundamental piece of any pitch deck is, what is the story uh, you wanna convey and can you convey it in a clear, concise way that shows you understand the problem you're solving and you've got the team to do it, and you've built the technology product or service that meets a market demand. So let's go into a few ways that uh, you might be able to think about uh, brainstorming and crafting. Sorry, Amanda, you're saying, can people hear me? May need to switch your screen. Oh, you're talking to the rest of the group. They may need to switch the speaker view to see the slides. Okay. Yes. Yes, I hear you. Can't hear me? No, the sound is good. Okay. Sound is good, yep. Yep. So the next slide. When you think of a pitch, we like to think of it as an analogy to the process of finding a job. Really, the goal is to progress to the next step of the process. So in a job interview, you're preparing, applying. Um, you know, the next step is getting an interview and your goal of the interview is to get an offer and then you accept and negotiate. So um, don't, don't try and think, think about accomplishing too much more in a pitch other than getting to the next step. And the most common thing for startups would be you're in an investor pitch and you'd like to get to a second meeting and start building a relationship and do some due diligence. Um, hopefully your pitch deck that you send ahead of time actually gets you a chance to pitch to somebody. So, so really think about it as an iterative process and the pitch deck is really the, the, the events you wanna to use to get to the next step in the process. So think of it as a, a stepwise process. To illustrate this further, and I can send the link uh, afterwards because these slides don't, don't come out too well, but in the software as a service space, there's something called the software as a service funding napkin. And this just gives you an idea of um, what type of growth rate or revenue uh, these companies need by different series of financing. So across the top, it says seed financing, which is typically in the range of 200,000. A series A financing is anywhere from one to 1.5 million. A series B could be anywhere from three to five. And the general rule of thumb in terms of growth you need is you know, growing kind of three times that revenue each year. You can see the valuations they put on each of those, but the piece I wanted to highlight, and it reinforces the importance, particularly for early stage companies, that it is really all about your story. Um, you really need to be looking at um, these elements here, which is an outstanding team with strong product experience or a deep understanding of the problem you're solving, um, where you can provide your unique, unique insights and talk about the founding team and the excellent fit. As you go farther along in the development of a startup, you start relying more on the more traditional metrics of uh, number of customers and growing revenue and whatnot. But so underscoring the importance of needing to craft a very carefully articulated story to land seed stage funding. And uh, I won't talk on this, this goes on a little bit more about um, 
the other elements that venture capitalists will be looking for. When you're putting together an investor pitch, we like to think of the three T's that investors are looking for. So as you're brainstorming your story and your story elements, uh, you know, typically they're looking for a technology or a solution to a compelling problem in the marketplace. They wanna see some evidence of traction and that traction can vary depending on the stage. So as I mentioned, software as a service, evidence of traction could be paying users, uh, repeatable customer acquisition growth, for deep technology companies where there's more of a research and development com component, you could be talking about hitting milestones and reducing risk to show that your technology will either scale or uh, work in the marketplace. Um, absent that, the next best signs of traction you can give is the results of your early stage customer discovery, user feedback and customer, customer testimonials. Investors will wanna know you understand your problem so well enough that you know who has the problem, uh, who's willing to pay for it, and how you actually might reach those users. And then the third T of the three T's is team. Uh, do you have a management team that will execute? Uh, how have you divided up the responsibilities amongst the founding team? And is there a strong fit with the founders and the market? So do you have the right expertise to develop it? And conveying those, Three things is an important framework to keep in mind as you start thinking about crafting your pitch story. Types of pitches. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this could be applicable to a, 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 an investor pitch, but other types of pitches could be helpful. And it's worthwhile taking your, your brainstorming story elements and fitting them into three buckets similar to these so that you have Sort of short, medium, and longer size versions of your slides that cater to different audiences. The elevator pitch is just what the name implies, as you probably know, 30 to 60 seconds to say, this is what our business is, and it's typically done in the, by way of analogy as the best approach sometimes. Uh, we are the X of Y, so like we are the uh, Uber of um, you know, lawn care delivery or something like that. Uh, for a comp competitive pitch, these are typically shorter. Um, so you're in a student pitch competition to get to win some money. Um, these are judged. Here you really wanna look at uh, the review, cr the criteria that the judges will be using. So instead of the, the completely, typically these are very consistent with what investors are looking for, but sometimes they'll in include elements of social innovation or benefit to a region or things like that. Um, in these kind of things, it's important to keep your decks as uh, one concept per slide and keeping your text minimal. And then the last one where we're gonna focus mostly for this webinar is the investor pitch. This is uh, eight to 12 slides. And for an investor pitch, you need to prepare, have it be interactive. Uh, you should have done your research on your investor to understand uh, what type of funds they have, whether they, the life cycle of that fund is at the beginning, middle or end, because it's different. Uh, if it's at the end of the fund, um, they, they may or may not have money to put on what's called follow-on investing. And it's different if it's at the beginning of the fund where they've got the full amount of the fund to invest. Looking at the, the investors' networks is, is important to understand what they've invested in the past. It may give you some insights as to what their frame of reference is. It's important to think of the pitch as a relationship building session. You really wanna build a relationship with the VC. And as I said at the beginning, the goal is another meeting. And so before I move on, I wanna emphasize one point here is that investor pitches should be interactive. So don't think about your slide deck and making sure you need to get through all of it. It could be that your, your venture group knows the area well and you don't need to go through two or three of your slides. And so uh, be sure to try and engage and respond to how the audience is talking to you because it, it will move you much farther down the curve in building a relationship uh, versus just making sure you kind of in a rote way go through your slides. So brainstorming should come before creating a pitch. Um, and this is again, uh, uh, comes takes from a blog article from Real Ventures and I'll put the link in at the end of the webinar. Uh, but it says before the deck comes the argument, which is an exercise in rhetoric. To build an argument, you only need words. Anything more is a distraction. 
And this group recommends, and, and this is just one strategy, you could pick whatever brainstorming uh, method you like, but they've got an approach where they actually use Microsoft Excel to create a series of bullet points, and I can extrapolate more on the next slide. But on this slide, they've got kind of a, a bullet statement, which is indoor agriculture is essential to the future of society. And then underneath those, they put very focused sort of fact-based statements to support it. So you've got kind of the selling point or feature, and then three bullet points that talk about very fact-based. This, this in many ways as a brainstorming exercise helps you funnel all your customer research, all your market data into a series of points that you can kind of assemble, mix and match into um, a presentation. This group also thinks about three things you wanna to do to convince a venture capitalist to join. And this is just, again, another example. There's many other ways you could look at this, but you want the investors to care about your problems. So you need to show that it's a, an important problem in the marketplace, you know, believe in the problem and your solution, and they'll want to join you as a partner to, to continue funding it. And so they take this approach of uh, going through a brainstorming uh, under these different categories. What are your bullet points that would ensure that they care, uh, that they'll believe in what you're doing, and they want to join you? So you'll get together a main argument, say half a dozen for each of these different categories with supporting points under each one that are fact-based based on your market research and that gives you a, a fair a fair bit of material to draw from and that's the brainstorming step from there you kind of piece them together uh, in a bit of a script or a story and i can go through what the outline of your slides should look like in a few minutes that leads to a rough deck and then a final deck In terms of structure of your deck, one of the ones we like to see here in our office is uh, a gentleman named Guy Kawasaki. He's got the rule he calls, I guess, 10, 20, and 30. 10 slides plus or minus is an optimal number. And he says that uh, it's difficult to grasp if you've got one item per slide, sort of more than 10 concepts uh, in, in an initial meeting. Typically, a pitch might be half an hour. Um, think about 20 minutes for uh, an hour long time slot, if you have an hour. Um, you, you really wanna build in some time for discussion so that uh, you're not rushed in doing your presentation and you leave time for discussion. I can go through an example of a company I was involved with uh, at Queen's University as a co-founder. Uh, we were on the last pitch to the investment committee to that, that ultimately led to us raising a series A financing. Um, they set up, a whole day of presentations and our team was the last to present. So you can imagine our one hour time slot got compressed down to 40 minutes and we had to continue through it. So we've kind of followed this approach where we had a 20 minute presentation and so we weren't rushed to get through it. Where we, we missed out was less time for discussion, but if you plan on you know much shorter time for your actual presentation and you start getting into a discussion, you're probably going well down a path to uh, to getting your next meeting or, or moving forward. And then just in terms of legibility, a 30 point font uh, makes the slide legible and you make one concept per slide. Your slides are really about um, reminding you what you wanna talk about rather than concepts you need to read verbatim in a presentation. So let's go through some of the sections of these 10 slides. Slide one would be a title slide, your company name, logo, and a one-liner about what you do. So that while you're waiting, this is kind of bonus time you can use in a presentation. It's usually investors are filing in, people are you know, maybe waiting for somebody to join. The title slide can kind of be up there and going, and everybody's already getting into the mind space of what your company is and what, you, what space you might be in and how you solve a problem. The next is you certainly need to convince an investor group um, what's wrong with the way the world currently works in terms of your problem. And then another slide on what your solution is. Investors will wanna see a slide on traction, whether that's revenue growth, product market fit, or as we said earlier, for earlier stage companies, this is often uh, user feedback. Um, talk a little bit more about market slide in, in the do's and don'ts section, but 
most investors will want to understand what size the market is, so the total addressable market. Um, they'll want to understand the competition. You know, I guess not so much in that competition is a worry. I think most investors want to see you understand your competitive landscape and see how you stratify them and where your organization would fit within the landscape and why you're differentiated or uh, you know, a log order better than some aspects or your other customers to give your investors comfort that, again, you understand the problem, you have a solution that people are willing to pay for, and that uh, you understand the marketplace and that uh, you're not simply trying to boil the ocean. Um, you need to talk a little bit about your business model, how you make money. Is it product sales? Is it recurring subscription model? Is it licensing? Is it a combination of things? A slide on the team, convince them why you're the right team to be doing this. Um, if you're a deep tech venture, they'll probably want to understand, or a life science company, they'll probably want to understand what intellectual property you have. If you've drafted and filed patents, this would be the place to list those. Um, you know, otherwise, if you're a software company or uh, some other type of service, describing something in this section that will give your investors confidence that you're creating a competitive moat for yourself that isn't easily copied or duplicated by others. What is your secret sauce? I guess is the answer here. And then always put in a call to action. Here's how much funding we want and here's what we want to use it for. And so uh, let me pause there. Any questions or comments from the group? Okay, next piece of advice we provide is practice way more than you think you'd ever need to, <laughs> to give a pitch. And uh, there's actually a neat function inside, if you're a Microsoft Office user, uh, inside a PowerPoint, you can actually kind of record yourself on your own laptop camera, uh, running through your presentation. And I gotta tell you, there's, there's nothing quite like um, practicing and then even just listening to the audio, um, you'll hear yourself, um, much like I do probably in this presentation, uh, using the pause words and joining statements and you'll figure out which words you might repeat or how you could maybe rephrase some things to come across strongly. Um, you know, rumor has it that Steve Jobs would spend a couple of days practicing his iPhone release pitches. So the more you practice, the more you'll be able to hone your story. And if you've got your story sort of nailed down, with the database of brainstorming materials, you'll also be ready to answer questions as you go through it. But can't emphasize it enough to practice uh, practice your pitches, uh, both by yourself and in front of uh, test audiences. Well, the last piece is important. Really think about the types of questions you're going to be asked. Uh, you know, there are times we see this when in uh, startups give a pitch and. It's difficult to do at the time, uh, which we acknowledge, but try to listen carefully to the question and make sure you're answering their questions quite often, well, not quite often, but sometimes you'll see entrepreneurs will acknowledge the question and then give some information, but that doesn't answer the question. In the moment, really think about what the question is. And if you need to ask a clarification, ask for clarification. But ahead of time, you could probably, and there's many lists of these on the internet, uh, look at a list of questions that you might be able to, you might be asked and start preparing your answers for them so that you'll be ready. And if, if you get asked one of these questions, you'll have it nailed. But uh, if nothing else, um, you'll be ready to, to think on your feet and answer these questions. So um, people want to understand where your idea came from, um, how you're filing patents, who your best customers might be, um, how did you build up your market in the slot, you know, all these kind of things. Uh, may come up depending on uh, on what the, the VC's level of interest in your group is. So dedicate time to preparing uh, for a list of uh, questions. So I'd like to go through an example pitch deck. Um, you've probably heard of Airbnb. There's a, a website uh, we can put in the link that uh, actually has uh, the pitch decks for a lot of the companies that have turned into so-called unicorns, but I thought we'd go through Airbnb to give you an example of how they used some of these principles to uh, land their initial financing. 
slide one, title, and a little bit about what they do. Book rooms with locals rather than hotels. You could picture this sitting up at a boardroom while people were filing in. So people had two or three minutes to read it and look at it. It's like, oh, okay. You're basically a, some kind of billeting service or, or renting out rooms in their house. Their problem, why hotels are inconvenient. Again, very simple um, bullet points, straight to the point, concisely written. And their solution, the web pl platform to turn this into a marketplace, allow me to advertise your house and meet you with uh, travelers. Market validation. So this is where uh, they looked at uh, the market data and trying to provide evidence that there's people trying to do this in various ways. And there's a lot of people wanting to list and uh, make more income from their properties. There are market size slides. So how many people book trips, how many book online and how many are booking with these early precursor services. Quick overview of their product, how they solve it, web platform, kind of three bullet points, easy workflow to understand how it works. Important to, as much as you can, simplify all the extensive work you're probably doing, building your products or services into a way that in front of an audience, you can say A, B, C, D, here's our workflow. And what's their business model? Well, when they make a match, they take a commission and look at how that might scale depending on what their market adoption would be. Their plan go to market, so this wasn't in the list, but this is essentially an extension of their business model, uh, looking at how they can use events, partnerships, or listings to uh, to seed their business and get, and get the two-sided marketplace going. This is a, a good way to put a competitive slide together. So just as a side note, I think it's always important to be clear you have an understanding of your competitors don't know that we'd ever recommend saying overly negative things about your competitors because you actually never know uh, what the background of a venture capitalist is and whether they know somebody or whatnot so you may inadvertently uh, make it difficult to get your next meeting but think of it think of it as a kind of a two-axis um, graph where you plot the icons of your competitors and you can define what the let what the x and y and the have a different axis will be. In this case, they're talking about affordable and expensive from top to bottom, and then offline booking versus online booking left to right. In your segment, just pick two ways that you think makes sense to show how you might be differentiated. This is this is a, a great way to do a, a competition slide. And then they talk about what their secret sauce is. So instead of IP, they talk about their competitive advantages. They've got their first to market, incentivizing hosts, easy to use, those kind of things that they build up as their competitive moat for, uh, for the marketplace. And so having gone through a set of slide examples, I'm gonna ask Amanda to go through um, a pitch that we've seen on YouTube described as one of the best startup pitches uh, you'll ever see. So Amanda, could you switch to that? And then we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit after. It's, it's about four minutes long. I'm so stressed out trying to plan all of life's celebrations. I mean, I got little Susie's graduation. I got Ted's birthday party. And of course, football season is coming back. I want to plan a tailgating party for that. <sighs> I wish there was one easy solution for me to order all my party supplies just as easy as booking an Airbnb. Wait, there is. Party On Demand is your one-stop mobile party supply shop delivering the party to you in one hour or less. We deliver the three essential ingredients you need to wow your guests and have an incredible memorable party. We deliver food, talent, and decorations right to your door. Bam! <laughs> we make it happen easily with our partnerships from Uber Eats, Grubhub, and Postmates delivering that tantalizing food that's yummy, yummy in your tummy. 
In addition to that, our friends over at Amazon Prime are hooking it up with our great, crazy curated party box that's delivered to your door. Plus, we have hooked up over 1,500 incredible talents of dancers, acrobatics, and even your own personal chef from Benihana, Katachi. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> It all starts with the box. Party on Demand has already partnered with over 35 of the world's largest companies and brands that's going to give you the cool thing. Think of Pinterest meets Etsy, deliver in your box and all exclusive right to your door. Oh man, it's going down. Our app is simple and easy to use and less than five clicks from your phone, your party is on. With over $251 billion in its licensing and rental industry, we know we're going to interrupt, disrupt this marketplace because over 800,000 people celebrate their birthday in the U.S. alone every single day, not including over 500,000 people that just have a great social and celebration as well. With that, Party on Demand situates ourselves between the sweet spot of affordability and convenience. Now, our revenue model was simple. Nowhere, and I mean nowhere, can you find food, talent, and decor delivered to your door same day for the incredible price. Wait for it. $299. Ow! Make it want to shake something. <laughs> We're asking for $1.5 million in exchange for 15% equity. This will give us a 15-month runway and yield profitably about $7.5 million. Party on Demand was inspired by my father, who passed away from cancer. But before he did, he said, son, celebrate life more often. Whether that's your job promotion or getting an A on a test or even crossing the street, celebrate life every single day. Now you don't have to stress no more or wonder how to put on a really cool party and impress your friends. We can do it for you. I'm Big Willie G, the CEO of Party On Demand, and we're helping you, 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 and your best friend sit next to you to party on. So call us, and I'll see you at the party. Woo, woo, woo. We can stop, man. Great. Um, so that was uh, the, the blog article said it's the, the best startup pitch you'll ever see. And uh, I guess one comment is if you if you really think of all the elements we've talked about, so Willie G had all of them. Within the first two minutes, you knew the problem he was trying to solve. He understood the market. He went through his differentiators. He talked about how he was going to provide a service. He talked about uh, you know his his value of the emotional piece and and uh, Creating these parties, so it was um, a pretty pretty interesting pitch. And I guess the other thing is Willie G as a presenter is obviously very compelling. And I'd encourage everybody to come kind of come up with their own style and own way to do it. So it was obviously natural for Willie G, but uh, I think it's an example of how in five minutes you can put in all the elements investors need to. And I think at this pitch competition, this was in Montreal, uh, they won the top prize of that pitch. So don't even really need slides sometimes if you can get your story down uh, as we uh, as you go through and so um, let's continue on the last part of our slides i call this the please don't section um, so as much as we go through the structure of things that you could consider for your deck there's a few things that probably shouldn't be in your deck or we'd recommend figuring out a way to make them simpler um, so no eye chart tests. You'll see people put up competitive landscapes like this. Uh, you know, other than to make the point, it's a crowded landscape. It's really not any information people could uh, um, under understand or use in a in a twenty minute pitch. Um, in your pitches, as I said earlier, don't try to boil the ocean. Keep your messages concise. You want to convey the problem you're solving the way you're solving the problem and the fact that you're the team to do it. Um, tr try not to spend too much time trying to bring the, the audience up to speed on what you're doing, kind of launch in so that they can pull it together for themselves as to what you're doing. It's kind of a show don't tell type thing, but uh, keep your messages concise and uh, make sure you keep your presentations focused. It's another one that's uh, I'd prefer not to see index, and it's the, the the example of you put up a market slide saying our product is going to play in a billion dollar marketplace. If we capture just 0.0001% of this marketplace, we'll have a successful company. Well, that so that may be true, but I think what investors 
will want to know is that you understand your users, who has the problem, how much they're willing to pay for your solution, and how you might reach out to them. Uh, they want to know there's a big enough market to make a business, but to say that if you only captured 0.001%, uh, in fact, discourages the investor from thinking you understand your market where you're just saying, hopefully it'll work out if I just get a small percentage of the market share. So do your best to understand what your users' motivation are, why they're willing to pay for your solution, those kind of things versus um, making statements like this. Um, shouldn't do live demos. You've heard Microsoft and even Steve Jobs have failures on screen. Uh, assume you won't have any internet connection, internet connection. So if you end up uh, presenting your product, do a screenshot or a very simple version of a screenshot so that there's, there's no chance that you'll lose an internet connection because that's just valuable time, particularly in, in like a pitch competition. Um, keep, keep, uh, keep your images static so you don't have, uh, have to have any risks. Appreciating that in this particular talk, I realized we did have something based on the internet. So. But this will be for a pitch competition. Um, and we talked about, so uh, will you, gee, whoop, sorry, I moved that slide down to have Amanda do it. So that's kind of what we wanted to cover. I wonder if I could open up the floor to questions. If anybody has a question in the chat, we can uh, answer them and I'll uh, look to um, answer those questions and then uh, put some of our, our links in the chat, so you can go look at some of the materials we've referenced uh, in further detail. And while we're waiting for the questions to come in on the slide here, there's two uh, Twitter channels, if you're interested in keeping track of what's going on in our office, and there's a few other uh, offices, Queens, like the Dun & Dishpandy Queens Innovation Center or the Smith School of Business that are worth following. Uh, amongst a few others for events uh, that might be going on to support research and innovation. So Jim, it looks like there's one question from Sarah that says, what if your team isn't as strong as you need it to be? For example, I'm a founder, but would need more people to fill out the business aspect. Yeah, I think in handling this question, you, you'd, I think just the way you've, you've described it, right? So you'd Put up and say here's the current management team and here's where we see it needing to go so i think what investors want to know is that you're not trying to do everything for yourself um you know it, it is a team sport more often than not and um you really want to ensure that um you understand what team you need to build in order to um a team you need to build to grow your business so just be upfront about it and say here's the team we have now and here's the positions we look to fill as we grow um, so there's another question in the chat do you have any advice or examples for a pitch deck more focused on selling a product or service in a b2b <laughs> transaction rather than an investor You know, there's an interesting data point we learned about uh, a few years ago. Uh, a study was done that actually taped Zoom calls between a salesperson and a buyer. And when they went and analyzed these calls later, they found out that if the client or the buyer was talking a much higher percentage of time relative to the salesperson, sales went up much higher. If it turned out that the salesperson was doing all the talking, the probability of sale went way down. I think we'd recommend the same advice in creating a B2B deck. You wanna create a deck that highlights the pain point you solve, but invites um, the client to talk about their problem and how they work in the space you're providing. Um, we, could, we could follow up with a link, uh, email to the group afterwards with a few examples of pitch decks, but. It, you generally, you could use a similar thing to a pitch deck, but I would be replacing some of the slides with um, how it benefits them. So you want to look at uh, what the return on investment would be for a buyer. So whether you're saying use our solution and save you X hours, you know, entrepreneurs and business owners always want to trade uh, trade time for value and money. 
Uh, but you certainly want to set up the discussion so that ideally the client is talking more than somebody at your company. Uh, and if you can create a deck that facilitates that, you probably have a higher percentage of uh, success in, in selling your products or services. Arash, I'm not sure I understand your question. Is there any support at Queens? Could you expand on your question, Arash, please? Uh, yes, I mean, that is there any possible support, for example, advisor, if you have an idea to uh, want to make the pitch deck for that? So is there any support or uh, any opportunity to have before we present it or go to any presentation? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's a number of offices at Queens. There's uh, our office, there's uh, DDQIC and Smith School of Business all have different programs. Um, but I'm sure you could reach out to our office, Amanda, I don't recommend an email address to, to send it to, saying you've got some ideas and you'd, you'd like to um, have somebody kind of vet your pitch or give you some pitch coaching. Yeah, we could, we could help with that. Thank you. Any other questions? Looks like John has one. Oh, um, okay. Says at what stage, if so, would investors want to see startup co-founders working exclusively for the venture before they fund such a company? And are those still employed, but with um, promising startup at a disadvantage in the eyes of investors? Hmm, that's a good question. I think once there was an investment, most certainly a venture capitalist would want to see founders working full time on the company. Um, particularly, I would imagine for angels or seed rounds, uh, an understanding that people are trying to turn their side hustle into a startup and into a business. Um, so, so I don't, I think if you've got a compelling solution where you find an investor that understands your story and it resonates, I don't know that if you were only working on it part time, it would make sense. I think most people are practical in knowing that uh, you know, everybody wants to earn a living or has to earn a living. Um, so I'd say once you're getting close to funding, I'm sure the investors would want to see somebody full time just to try and maximize the impact of their investment. Particularly for early stage funding, I don't think it would necessarily be a, a hurdle or an hindrance in the eyes of investors. Okay, well, thanks everybody for attending. If you wanna stick around for a minute and give me a minute to cut and paste the resources into the chat, or if you're, if you're not interested, you, please, please feel free to, to go about uh, the rest of your day. Thanks everybody for attending.